economy for the benefit of the big banks and the brokerage houses, and then deploy paramilitary police forces to suppress the victims of this robbery when their impoverishment finally drives them into the streets in despair. Well, to oppress the people who should be protected and to protect the people who should be arrested are not the acts of any government worthy of that name. So in the minds of many Americans, the general government is today, just as the British government was in 1773, truly no government at all. One thing has changed, however, since 1773, and much for the worse. Then, patriots realized that at some point, this meeting, and any mere meeting, can do nothing more to save the country. They knew that actions not only do, but must speak louder than words. And to do so, actions must take the place of words. And to do that, there must be planning and execution of plans. Today, although there are a great number of meetings and a great deal of talk amongst patriots, with all of the dissemination and amplification of the internet allows, there are but few viable plans and precious little effective action aimed at rebuilding the necessary foundations of constitutional government in this country as a whole, or even in a single state, as an exemplar to the rest. Contemporary patriots are generating a gigantic head of superheated steam. But as with any steaming engine, the pressure should not be wasted on the whistle, but instead applied to the pistons in order to turn the wheels so the engine can move forward. particularly now that what the speakers can say will be spread far and wide over the internet. And no one can deny the value of education in principle. Yet the question always remains, is this process actually working in practice and in a sufficiently timely fashion to bring about meaningful political change? Well, as a firearms instructor, I follow the guideline that every important point should be repeated to my students at least five times in the lecture. Audibly, visually, and if possible, even with tactility in the form of some kind of hands-on demonstration. For the three basic rules of firearm safety, I go even further with repetition taken to many multiples of five. Apparently, though, the fundamental principles of a free and secure political community need even more iterations and reiterations. For I have been harping for years on the necessity for Americans to enforce the Constitution themselves by reasserting those two great powers of government, the power of the purse and the power of the sword. But these efforts have had little effect. By every measure, this message is seeping in with no more than the speed of water penetrating granite. And although given enough time, flowing water will wear away even granite, Time inexorably does go by, and time inevitably does run out. Is the reluctance of American patriots to take this advice to heart in the form of action the result of their inability to understand it? I doubt that. After all, the matter is not arcane or complicated. The Constitution was originally meant for common farmers, yeomen, mechanics, artisans, sailors, and tradesmen of relatively humble origins, as well as for rich merchants, wealthy planters, and aristocrats with polished educations. And everything that they knew, any modern American can know, if he takes the trouble to study them. What, for example, is too difficult to understand in the Second Amendment's declaration that a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be. The problem is that too many contemporary patriots are dissipating their energies on too many disparate political issues that in the long run will prove to be indecisive, even if patriots should prevail on many of them. Politics today has degenerated into a form of fast food court, with the big media and the internet serving up one sizzling issue du jour after another, for people who have short attention spans and want simplistic answers deliverable in sound bites. These issues, however, amount to merely minor skirmishes in a far larger battle, and the key to winning any battle is not to fight to exhaustion at the peripheral points, but to take and defend the high ground. 
So in the long run, patriots really should not be excessively concerned with matters such as national ID, socialist health care, even the newest Ponzi swindle, cap and trade scheme, or any of the other dodges that the establishment is trying and will try to foist on this country through supposed statutes or treaties. True enough, patriots should oppose these measures but not at the cost of diverting too many of their scarce resources from what should be the critical areas of contention. For even if enacted or ratified, each and every one of these statutes and treaties can be declared unconstitutional or repealed or renounced once patriots have achieved decisive control of the constitutional high ground of government. Moreover, patriots really no longer have any choice as to whether this follows, as, what, as to whether this, as whether they should follow this strategy or not. For if Americans do not gain control of the constitutional high ground of government, and soon, the establishment will simply continue to confront them with an endless series of these puffed up political crises, which will wear them out financially, physically, and psychologically. Constitutional high ground of government consists of those two great powers, the power of the purse, and the power of the sword. That's what political philosophy, and not just American political philosophy, has taught since the days of the ancient Greeks. Consider first the power of the purse, which includes the power over the definition, creation, and regulation of money. To be sure, many patriots believe that with the ever-growing demand for order in the Federal Reserve System, Americans are on the road to retaking this power. In this regard, I am reminded of how Mikhail Gorbachev excoriated the leaders of the Soviet Union's nuclear energy establishment after the reactor melted down at Chernobyl. For 30 years you have told us that everything was perfectly safe. You assumed that we would look up to you as gods. That's the reason why all this happened. Why it ended in disaster. There was no one controlling the ministries. Everything was kept secret. The system is plagued by servility, favoritism, and clannish management. And there are no signs that you have drawn the necessary conclusions. In fact, it seems as though you are trying to cover up everything. We are going to put an end to all this. We have suffered great losses, not only economic ones. There have been economic human victims, and there will be more. We have been damaged politically. All our work has suffered. From now on, what we do will be visible to our people and to the world. We need full information. Gorbachev, that was the famous Glasnost openness program. Well, in any comparison between Chernobyl and the contemporary Federal Reserve System, Gorbachev's indictment vastly understates the case. For today, America faces an impending meltdown of the fiat currency and fractional reserve central banking scam, which will prove far more dangerous and perhaps even more deadly to a great many more people than Chernobyl ever did. America's goal, however, must not be just full information about the Federal Reserve. America needs not simply to audit the Federal Reserve so as to expose its corruption, but to abolish it, absolutely. than for them to regain the power of the purse, 